I am Dr. Shekhar Agarwal, Executive Director and Joint Replacement Surgeon at the Delhi Institute of Trauma and Orthopedics at San Parmanand Hospital in New Delhi. In this talk, I shall be talking about the biomechanics of the hip, both in health and disease. The word biomechanics was the term coined by a Soviet neurophysiologist and came from the ancient Greek words bios meaning life and mechaniki meaning mechanics. So biomechanics is a study of structure and function of biological systems by means of methods of mechanics. The objectives of the talk are threefold. Firstly to talk on the biomechanics of the hip joint and introduce terms such as kinematics, kinetics, free body analysis and diagram, determinants of joint reaction force and then applied biomechanics of hip disorders. I will then dwell on to the biomechanics of hip replacement in which we will cover design philosophy and talk on offset, frictional torque forces and volumetric and linear wear and finally hip instability which will talk about component design, component alignment and soft tissue tensioning and functioning. In a normal undiseased hip, there is an articulation of the femoral head and the acetabulum which is highly confirming. The joint is well lubricated, it is compliant and it is very very stable. If you look at the anatomy of the hip, it is a classical ball and socket joint and by virtue of its bony anatomy, ligaments and capsular anatomy, neurovascular anatomy and muscular anatomy is a very very stable joint. The terms that I wish to introduce are statics and dynamics, kinematics which is a study of motion with respect to the relationship between displacement, velocity and acceleration without concern of motion. Then there is kinetics which is relates to the forces acting on a rigid body to its resulting motion. And finally kinesiology which is a study of human motion. The hip joint is a highly congruent joint but we know that the femoral head is not truly round. There is a migratory movement of the femoral head in the acetabulum in varying degrees of flexion, extension, abduction and adduction. The head basically spins in all these movements and glides posteriorly or anteriorly depending on the arc of movement. So the kinetics, the forces acting on a normal hip is enormous. If we look at normal walking, the forces acting on the hip is usually three times the body weight which increases to seven times body weight on fast walking. On SLR, which is straight, straight leg raising, it is twice the body weight. In running, it is ten times. And even sitting on a chair unaided, it is four times the body weight. So the free body analysis, we will look at single leg stance. The weight of the leg is usually one-sixth of the body weight. The abductor muscle action force is the primary stabilizer of the pelvis in a single leg stance. If we look at the lever arm which is the distance between the point of action of force and the pivot and Archimedes used to say give me a place to stand and I shall move the earth with it. So the lever arm ratio is the body weight moment arm divided by the abductor movement lever arm and in a single leg stance this ratio is 2.5. What are the determinants of joint reaction force? It is the body weight, the body weight moment arm, the abductor force and the abductor force moment arm. The two dimensional analysis of joint reaction forces. In a bipedal stance we know that the center of gravity is centered in between the two hips. In a single leg stance the effective center of gravity moves distally and away from the supporting leg. The hip joint reaction force is calculated by applying the force equilibrium condition which is the sum of all forces acting on the hip leading to zero. And when the three forces acting on body, 
these forces form a closed force triangle in hip disorders the pathomechanical factors that act are an increase in body weight increase in the body weight moment arm there is a decrease abductor force and a decrease abductor force moment arm so the management of painful hip disorders our aim is to reduce the joint reaction force the joint reaction force equals the body weight and the abductor force and therefore our strategies are targeted to reduce the joint reaction force by reducing the body weight or its moment arm and help the abductor force or its moment arm so in the management of hip disorders our first step is reduction of body weight and how do we achieve that you decrease the body weight moment arm for example in the trendelenburg gate there is a decreased body weight moment arm leading to a decrease in the abduction abductor functional demand and leading to a decreased joint reaction force this also helps the abductor force or its moment arm which provides an additional moment such as the use of a walking stick in the opposite hand which will lead to a 67% reduction of the abductor force so if you use an incorrect use of walking aids in patients with hip pathology it is not going to help such a patient and this is an article which concluded that the contralateral hand to the hip pathology should be used with a walking aid to reduce the pressures across the hip joint this also helps the abductor force or its moment arm an increase in abductor lever arm would increase the offset uh, such as by an osteotomy or a tra transfer of the greater trochanter on the lateral side let's look at the next shaft angle in a normal adult it is usually 125 degrees plus or minus 5 degrees in a coxa valga this is more than 130 degrees and in a coxa vera this would be less than 120 degrees let's now talk of gait gait is a mechanism that allows a person to move the body weight which is bw and the center of gravity as desired and very economically so during the gait cycle the center of gravity oscillates laterally and vertically and is usually a 5 cm rise or fall during the gait cycle so in a normal gait there is symmetry of step length and symmetry of step duration and any deviation from either of these two will lead to limping so therefore in patients with arthritis of the hip the gait changes are observed such as a decrease in the stride length a decrease in the gait speed or a decrease in sagittal hip to knee movement and hip extension so after hip replacement if patients do not regain normal gait as they do not gain normal muscle strength and muscle endurance so therefore their gait pattern will remain abnormal and the surgical approach will also influence the gait pattern after a hip replacement now we move on to total hip replacement and biomechanics the aim of total hip replacement is to relieve pain and improve function this is by increasing the offset and the lever arm what was charnley's and bill harris's philosophy they used prosthesis which was proximal collar to prevent sinking the rough surface was used to promote bonding and the all interfaces both on the acetabular side and the femoral components were fixed with cement the ling and lee philosophy uh, there was no proximal collar in their implants the implants were polished and tapered the bone interface was fixed with stem with cement and the sem stem cement interface was free to slip inside the cement mantle which meant that it was a taper slip the implant allowed for sinking which was a controlled subsidence and this philosophy believed in a collarless polished taper design what what about neck lengths and offsets this is ideal for femoral reconstruction it reproduces normal center of rotation of the hip its location is determined by medial offset vertical offset and version of the femoral neck 
There are few more terms that we need to discuss about is volumetric and linear wear. The sliding distance differs according to the diameter of the head that is used. And the sliding distance is related to the radius of the head. The volumetric wear is also related to the sliding distance which is less significant. The linear wear is related, inversely related to the radius and the sliding distance and this is more important. Chanli believed in the low frictional torque arthroplasty which meant that the frictional force uh, uh, times the length of the lever arm and the smaller it is smaller with a smaller diameter head and if you increase the frictional torque it led to loosening of the femoral component. So Sir John Chanli believed in low frictional torque arthroplasty and he achieved this by lateralization of the abductors and medialization of the center of rotation by deepening the socket and using a small femoral head. Let's look at factors which cause instability after hip replacement. There are four major factors which relate to component design, component position, soft tissue tensioning and soft tissue functioning. The primary arc range is the arc an articulation which moves before impinging and levering out. What is the jump distance? Jump distance is the distance the head needs to travel before the dislocation occurs. Usually it is half of the diameter of the head. So if you use a diameter of the femoral head which is 32 millimeters, the jumping distance is 16 millimeters. For a 22 millimeter head, it is 11 millimeters. So obviously the jump distance or the chance to dislocate is higher if you use a smaller diameter femoral head. What about the size of the taper? The size of the taper influences the stability by affecting the head neck ratio. The narrow neck tapers there is more stability which is therefore it is a favorable head neck ratio. Conversely an addition of collar on the modular head increases the neck diameter and adversely affects the head neck ratio and increasing the chance of impingement and dislocation. What about augmentation of the acetabular component? It is usually by a long posterior wall which we normally call an LPW or there is an elevated posterior wall an EPW and finally there is the use of constrained liners to prevent dislocation. The component alignment is very very important and this should be in terms of an acetabular component which should not have an, an, an uh, angle uh, of inclination more than 45 or 50 degrees and an acetabular antiversion which should be about 10 to 15 degrees. The soft tissue balancing is also very critical to restore the offset and neck, and neck length for tensioning and the neurological axis for function. So in total hip replacement there are permanent changes in the hip joint. There is alteration to soft tissue envelope that is the muscles around the hip and there is alteration in joint mechanics because of the elasticity of the components. There is lubrication and load transmission which should be done very efficiently to allow for stability of the hip joint. The next thing to consider is the lubrication of the hip joint, the elastohydrodynamic lubrication. So if the synovial fluid was trapped, the, it has a good load bearing capacity of surfaces. In a prosthetic joint, lubrication is very different and this is by a mechanism of either a boundary lubrication or a free fluid lubrication or a mixed lubrication. So you have a boundary lubrication you have a mixed lubrication and a free and a mixed lubrication which is usually seen in most clinical situations. The bearing surfaces are usually polyethylene and then you have metal and ceramic. So the femoral heads can be made of metal or uh, ceramic. The cup is usually a high density molecule poly high density molecular weight polyethylene or it could be a cross-linked polyethylene or it could be the cup could be made of metal or it could be made of 
ceramic the crucial issue is the head cup material couple and that has a direct relation to wear so the couples of the head and the acetabulum in a total hip is either a hard on hard bearing examples being a metal on metal or a ceramic on ceramic then you have hard on soft examples being metal on poly or a ceramic on poly and and then you have a soft on soft which is usually a normal hip joint so where in primary in vivo wear mechanisms there is an adhesive wear which is the bonding of the surfaces when they are pressed together under load and this results in material being pulled away from one or more surfaces usually from the weaker material then there is an abrasive wear in which the aspartes on the harder surface cut and plow through the surface softer surface removal of the material and then you have fatigue wear when the material then fails after a certain number of loading cycles with release of the material from the surface of the implant so these are the various modes of wear mode one being from the motion of two primary bearing surfaces against each other as intended mode two being condition of a primary bearing surface moving against a secondary surface which is not intended mode three being condition of the primary surfaces moving against each other but with third body particles such as cement or pieces of bone which can be interposed and this is usually called a third body wear and fourth being two secondary which are non primary surfaces rubbing rubbing against each other in using an ultra molecular weight polyethylene if the head moves consistently in one direction uh, that is linear motion its molecules reorient and harden in that direction and this leads to strain hardening if the wear tracks in multi direction this leads to strain hardening and wear reduction wear track in hips is ellipti elliptical and eccentric the wear rate is proportional to the amount of cross shear the femoral head undergoes micro separation in acetabular cup during the gait cycle by 1 to 4 mm similar micro separation also occurs in unconstrained total hip arthroplasty the metal on metal and alumina on alumina which is means ceramic on ceramic these hips are less vulnerable for micro separation so in conclusion uh, biomechanics of hip is indeed very complex and one needs to understand the forces acting across the hip both during health and disease how the use of a walking cane can reduce the forces across the hip and cause significant reduction of pain and how these biomechanical forces are utilized to get an optimum outcome following total hip replacement thank you very much for your kind attention